Kia ora koutou katoa. I'm Francesca from Charity Services and joining me today is Paul Budd, a senior investigator from our investigations team. Thank you for taking the time to join us today for this webinar on how to detect and prevent fraud. This is the third webinar in our lunchtime webinar series for 2019. Our lunchtime webinars in this series have been focused on charities that work overseas. Inland Revenue presented a webinar in August about knowing your tax obligations, and the Ministry of Justice and the Police presented the last one on protecting your organisation from terrorism financing. If you missed them, they're available on the Charity Services YouTube channel, and last year's series are also available on YouTube if you need a refresher. Search Charity Services on YouTube to find them. To find out when the next webinar is, please, please do sign up for our newsletter on our website, www.charities.govt.nz, or you can sign up for the Charity Services Facebook page so you know when they're coming up. So we're just going to talk a little bit about logistics here and let you know how the webinar will run. Can you hear us? Make sure your computer sound is unmuted. Ignore the muted microphone icon. If you're having echoing or distortion coming through your speakers, then you should try using headphones instead, as this may help. If your sound is cutting out intermittently, check your internet connection and maybe turn it off and on and see if that helps. The webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a link to the recording in the next few days. If you don't receive it, please let us know. Any links or resources that we talk about today will also be sent to you by email in the next few days. This is a listen only webinar. Click on the question mark icon to type in your questions. If your question doesn't get answered during the webinar, please email at info at charities.govt.nz. And if you want to download the handout, click on the document icon on the right panel of your screen. So we've split the webinar today into three main areas. Firstly, we'll explain what fraud is and why it matters for charities. And then we're going to talk to you about what to do to prevent it, detect it and report it. Finally, Paul will talk about how we deal with fraud at charity services and he'll talk us through some examples about how fraud was effectively dealt with in a charities context. We will have some time for questions at the end. You can type in your questions throughout the webinar and we'll choose some to answer. If your question doesn't get answered today, remember you can email it to us at info at charities.govt.nz. We'll also send you an email with links to any resources we talk about and a link so you can share the webinar with your board or your committee or you can watch it again later. So you might be wondering why we are doing a webinar on fraud, because the charitable sector is all about doing good for others. And although most charities are small, together they make up a dynamic not-for-profit sector, which contributes a whopping $18 billion annually to New Zealand's economy. That is a lot of money. It's comparable to what the building industry in New Zealand contributes. The assets of the charitable sector are enormous too, and they're worth over $58 billion, so it's actually really important that we protect them for future generations. There are also over 27,000 charities in New Zealand, run largely by people who volunteer their time, their energy and money to make sure the sector keeps ticking over for the good of our society. So we're talking about fraud today because this sector has assets worth protecting and people in it who really care. We want you to go away today knowing how to better protect your charity and your resources from fraudsters. We're also talking about fraud today because New Zealand is a member of the Financial Action Task Force. They set standards and promote measures to combat money laundering, terrorist financing and other threats to the international financial system. The task force make recommendations and monitor a number of countries to make sure they're implemented. Providing information to the not-for-profit sector is one of the obligations we have as a member country. I'm now going to hand you over to Paul and he's going to talk through the next slide about why charities might be vulnerable. Kia ora. 
So why are charities vulnerable? This sector thrives because there is a high level of public trust and confidence in charities. Fraudsters are aware of this and can use it to provide a respectable cover for their fraudulent activities. The sector has a culture of trust built on people giving, volunteering, helping and doing good for others. Whilst this is great, this kind of trust also gives opportunities to fraudsters to operate without raising suspicions. We know it is sometimes hard to get enough willing and able helpers in charities. So often one person has a wide range of duties that aren't segregated enough to protect them or the charity. It's a risky business when the committee on board or the board don't have enough oversight over the money or the assets and this lack of oversight can create an opportunity for fraud. Other vulnerable areas include irregular cash flow. Charities often have irregular cash flow that is hard to track. Cash is used for trading activities, street collections, and often given directly to the charities as donations. Suspicious activity is harder to detect when cash flows are irregular and there is no system in place to record them. Some charities have complex financial systems involving multiple donors or investments that can have no regular pattern to them. These kind of transactions can make it harder to identify fraud. Two of the other biggest factors that create vulnerability is poor governance and the lack of controls mechanism. We will talk some more later in the webinar about how to improve your governance practice and we will also provide you with some resources about financial control. Mechanisms to help you protect your charity. Finally, Charities that operate overseas are at particular risk because it's harder to verify that groups you are supporting are actually carrying out charitable activities. So I've worked for charity services for nearly six years now. And in my role, I only ever meet people who are diligent, hardworking, and trying to do the best for their charity. Paul probably sees a little bit more of the dodgy stuff than I do, but we do know that the majority of the sector are doing a great job. So I did a quick Google search to see how much fraud we're seeing in New Zealand, and these are a few of the headlines I found from New Zealand papers. So if you see, if you look at the slide, there's quite a few there. Fraud is alive and well in Aotearoa, and as we'll talk about later, you are most at risk from those who are in trusted positions in your charity. So what is fraud? Well, in a nutshell, fraud is obtaining a financial or personal gain by deliberate deception. Some examples of fraud are stealing donations made to the charity, diverting charitable funds to a personal account, manipulating documents such as receipts, invoices, financial statements in order to receive a personal benefit, personal use of charitable resources unrelated to the charity's work, such as fuel cards, supermarket vouchers, overseas travel that is not related to the charity's purposes, misusing grants, underspending on the grant and then manipulating documentation to hide the remainder of the money, tax evasion, diverting charity funds or resources to a personal business. Who commits fraud? A number of studies have been done to identify characteristics of a fraudster. While there are trends, fraud can be committed by anyone. Fraud can be committed internally by a staff member, an officer of a charity, or someone who volunteers. Externally, fraud sometimes occurs by people that you contact or contract in, or who supply goods or services to your charity. Most often, fraud is committed by people in trusted positions inside your charity. So what types of fraud are there? You probably haven't spent much time in your monthly committee me meeting talking about fraud. We know that most charities are too busy doing the do, running the charity, making sure they deliver on what they've planned to do. However, it's important to be aware of fraud and where loopholes might exist for people to be able to commit it and also how fraudulent behaviour might affect your charity. 
So internal fraud is committed by someone inside your charity who you probably know well and respect and trust. An external fraud is committed from someone outside of your charity and could involve a well thought out sophisticated plan or might just be someone who sees an opportunity and takes it. Paul's going to talk a little bit more about internal fraud. Internal fraud is a growing issue in the charity sector. There have been estimates that over a third of all frauds are internal, committed by staff, volunteers and trustees. It's not just charity finances that are affected by internal fraud. It can damage the morale of the staff and the volunteers and damage the reputation of a charity. It's important to be aware of the warning signs and ensure there are good controls in place and the right culture to help deter, prevent and detect fraudulent activity. I'll talk some more about these topics later in the webinar. Fraud happens usually because someone sees an opportunity to commit it. Typically, the three main contributors to internal fraud are excessive trust in staff, a lack of governance oversight and the absence of controls to protect the charity. Some of the more typical things we see are people stealing goods or money from a charity shop or other trading activity, stealing cash donations, especially common with street collections, using charity accounts for personal use, claiming non-existent, inappropriate or excessive expenses, creating false or inflated invoices or purchase orders for goods or services that are never supplied to the charity, submitting false applications for grants or misusing grant money for the wrong purpose, creating non-existent employees or beneficiaries to whom to direct the money payments. External fraud is committed by someone who is outside of your charity. There are a number of well-known ways that people who aren't in your charity can rip you off. False invoicing is one way used by external fraudsters in order to obtain money from a charity. The invoices will usually contain fake supplier identities and purchase orders in order to obtain payment for goods or services that have not been received. Charities of all sizes are vulnerable to this type of fraud and in many cases these invoices are paid because staff assume they must have received the services or goods. To prevent false invoicing fraud, ensure all invoices are assigned to someone in the charity who can verify that the services or goods have been received and you do that before the invoice is paid. Charities should also bear in mind that invoice fraud can be an internal risk too. Dishonest staff members could create and pay their own fraudulent invoices. Another way is unauthorized fundraising, which plays on the sympathy and the goodwill of others by asking them to make a donation to a cause. Usually the request will be linked to a high profile event, such as a flood or an earthquake. Fraudsters will ask for money in different ways. For example, via email, where you pay by credit card or a collection box in a public place. In an increasing number of cases, they misuse the name of other charities and then pocket the money. Officers should take appropriate steps to stop the unauthorized fundraising, including legal action if necessary, and they should ensure that all donations are then passed on to their charity. Credit card scams. Earlier this year in New Zealand, we were informed that online scammers were targeting New Zealand charities with an overpayment scam. The scammers targeted all donation channels, including donation forms on charity websites, phone donations, as well as third party online platforms. Scammers were making donations using stolen credit card details. After donating, they contacted the charity to request a refund for a claimed overpayment. They gave realistic excuses convincing people that they had intended to, don to donate only $100 instead of $1,000 and that they would experience personal hardship if the money is not returned. 
They then ask the charity to return the overpayment to a bank account or a different credit card to the one used in the original transaction. The idea is that the scammer hopes the charity, the charity will return the money before realizing the donation was fraudulent. Remember, if you receive a direct refund request for a donation, always review the transaction details with the entity who processed the transaction before agreeing to a refund. Never agree to a refund a credit card donation to a bank account or a different credit card. Be wary of online donors who claim they donated too much or made an error when entering the donation amount. Identity fraud can mean a few different things. One instance is where someone hacks a charity's bank account and withdraws all the money. Alternatively, ident identity fraud can occur when someone sets up a fake charity and does either a door-to-door -door collection, a street collection, or telemarketing for donations to scam people. So you're probably wondering now what your responsibilities are. Being an officer of a charity is a serious business and you do have some certain obligations to fulfill. Three of the most common are the duty to act in the best interest of your charity, the duty to avoid conflicts of interest arising and the duty to act with reasonable care and due diligence. As an officer, you have a legal duty to protect your charity's assets and to ensure that the charity's finances are managed in a responsible way. Your role is to ensure that everyone in your charity, from the board or committee members, the staff and the volunteers, you need to make sure they are all aware of the risks of fraud and what it can mean for the reputation of your charity. It's important your whole team understands the risks and they know what to look out for. You need to make sure that there are proper financial controls in place and the right kinds of policies and procedures to minimise the risk of fraudulent behaviour. You also need to act responsibly if you do detect fraud. Fraud is a crime. You need to make sure you report it to the police and to charity services and then you need to take steps to manage the consequences. Financial loss and reputational damage can be reduced by effective pre prevention. It's far more cost effective to prevent fraud than to investigate it and remedy the damage done. The prevention needs to be proportionate to the size of your charity. You need to think about whether you have effective financial controls in place for the size of your charity. One size won't, but it needs to be proportionate to the type of charity that you're running. Do you have good systems and record keeping in place? Have you checked that you have a conflict of interest policy and a register to record any conflicts? Are you reporting on related party transactions in your performance report? And if you do discover fraud, do you have a policy in place that will help you with the next steps of dealing with it? It is far easier to devise a policy before the fraud occurs rather than after the fact. Do you have something in place to protect your staff if they want to let you know that they think fraud is occurring? Ensure your staff or your volunteers can safely talk about fraud by putting in place a disclosure policy. If possible, have different lines of reporting so staff feel comfortable approaching different members of the board if they suspect one member of wrongdoing. Are you and your committee open to discussing fraud and risk prevention regularly? Is it on your agenda? Make sure it is and make sure someone in your charity keeps up with the new ways that fraud is emerging. It's not just about putting the petty cash box away at night anymore. Fraudsters are clever. They've developed some very sophisticated techniques with technology to fool you. So be aware. Preventing cyber fraud. Cyber fraud is another risk to your charity. You need to make sure you protect yourself by using antivirus software, strong passwords, and ensure that your software is updated regularly. Cyber criminals frequently use known flaws in your software to gain access to your system. Patching these can make it less likely that you'll become a cyber crime target. You also need to take measures to help protect yourself against identity theft. 
Identity theft occurs when someone wrongfully obtains your personal data in a way that involves fraud or deception, typically for economic gain. How? You might be tricked into giving personal information over the internet, for instance, or a thief might steal your mail to access your account information. That's why it's important to guard your personal data. A VPN, short for Virtual Private Network, can also help to protect the data you send and receive online, especially when accessing the internet on public Wi-Fi. Finally, always verify transactions before you make them, and don't just rely on an email. Emails are easily faked. It always pays to pick up the phone and verify that you are dealing with the right person. How to detect fraud in your charity. There are some things that can alert you to fraudulent behavior. There are unusual or suspicious expenses. These could be signs of false or inflated expenses. Ensure there are thorough internal controls to look for all accounts, searching for discrepancies. Look out for any letter or email that appears to be from an organization or an individual you regularly make large payments to, telling you that they now have a different bank account. Fraudsters might have hacked into your emails and stolen their identity. They will often use the same bank branch, but it will be their personal account. Even if the email comes from the recognized email address, has all the same letterheads, the same signature, and has been sent at a time when payment is almost due, it could still be fraudulent. Be sure to contact someone at the organization you make the payments to and check whether it is a genuine request. Have new suppliers been added to your accounting system lately? This could be a sign of invoicing fraud where false invoices from made up suppliers are submitted by staff and paid without question. The supplier's bank accounts to which the money is transferred are usually the fraudulent staff member's personal account. Look for abnormal or unusual behavior from your staff or volunteers. For example, are they trying to put off audits or work reviews? If only one person is in control of the entire financial process, try to work out if they are reluctant to accept assistance and be aware if the financial information presented at meetings suddenly changes or becomes more complex. If you think a crime has been committed, you need to report it to the police as soon as you can. If the fraud relates to your charity's finances, make sure you contact your bank straight away to ensure your accounts are put on hold so that they can't be accessed anymore by the fraudster. Remember to also report it to charity services as fraudulent activity and can indicate other issues such as mismanagement or a lack of oversight. Reporting to us is easy to do. Just email compliance at dia.govt.nz. Charity Services Approach to Fraud. So what is our approach to fraud? Charity services may inquire into anyone alleged to be engaged in conduct that is in breach of the Charities Act or serious wrongdoing in connection with a registered charity. What types of complaints does Charity Services deal with? Charity Services receives a number of complaints and may investigate any suspected breaches of the Charities Act or wrongdoing in connection with a registered charity. An inquiry is undertaken if it is considered reasonably necessary. We also initiate our own inquiries and we respond to information provided to us by the public. Our role as a regulator is to ensure that we protect the charity as well as protecting the broader sector to protect trust and confidence. It's also important that we help the governing group to ensure they are complying with their legal duties and obligations and to put the right controls in place to avoid fraudulent behavior in the future. That might mean working with the charity to understand how the fraud occurred, providing education to ensure it can't happen again, and helping to put some safeguards in place to protect the charity's assets. 
If the charity is not willing to work with us, or the fraud has resulted because of a deliberate non-compliance, we may advise the charity's registration board for them to consider using their formal enforcement powers to deregister the charity. Now, unfortunately, I've encountered many examples of fraud in the six years that I've been at charity services. On one particular investigation, many of the examples of fraud that we've already mentioned were present. The charity was created with the purported intention of providing food parcels for families in financial difficulties. One of the main players was at that time disqualified from being a trustee as he was bankrupt and his involvement with the charity was not reported to us. The name chosen for the charity was extremely similar to that of an existing, honest and hardworking charity. The new charity people then contacted donors of the honest charity and pretended that they were the same charity with a slightly changed name and a different bank account. In this way, they persuaded many of the donors to support them. And through the generosity of those donors, the cash flowed in. Alas, instead of doing good, the people treated the trust account as their own private bank account to fund a lavish, lavish lifestyle. Alerted by complaints from the legitimate charity and concerned donors, we began to investigate. We used our regulatory powers to compel the charity to provide us with details of their operations and setup. We asked them to tell us how many families they supported and the contact details for those families. In response, the charity produced details of their delivery processes and claimed some 50 or more families were their regular beneficiaries. To account for their spending, lacking any real receipts or accounts, they supplied a mass of false documents purported they even dipped into waste bins in public places and retrieved and used other people's discarded receipts and a large amount of bus tickets. Using the information they supplied us, we kept observations on the charity premises on the days that they claimed to be active gathering and distributing food parcels, but we saw no such activity. We visited the reported 50 regular beneficiaries, but they told us they'd either only ever received one food parcel from the charity, or in some cases, nothing at all. We even used our powers to seize a computer from the charity, and upon examination, discovered that it had been used to create many of the false documents the charity had been required to send us. When we were holding all the information we needed to, we called in various people from the charity for interviews. It soon became apparent that the back bankrupt main player had handpicked trustees that he could control and influence. And hiding behind them, he was controlling the charity, giving himself a salary, and he had a firm hold of the charity's purse strings. In his interview, he denied ever having had access to the charity's bank accounts and stated he had never held or even used the charity's FPOS card. We then showed him a series of photos taken from bank ATM machines, showing him over several months making thousands of dollars of cash withdrawals. We had again used our powers under the act to obtain this evidence from the banks. Working with the company's office and the police, we were able to get the trust put into liquidation and struck off. We got the charity deregistered and the police prosecuted the main offender for theft. The beneficiaries were put in touch with the, the legitimate charity. Not all fraudsters in a charity set up deliberately to commit fraud. Another organization I investigated was established for preschool and after school education services, and it received recognition for good work from the Ministry of Education. It also benefited from, benefited from grants from the Ministry of Education. Sadly, one of the main persons at the charity got into financial problems and tried to gamble their way out of debt but of course, it only got worse. Next, they began falsifying student attendance levels and teacher numbers to fraudulently qualify for additional funding from the Ministry of Education. When that was not enough, 
they began stealing money from the charity by writing checks to cash and using their standing in the charity were able to get other trustees, often family members or close friends, to countersign the checks. And eventually, they just forged other trustees' signatures on the checks. To try and cover up their wrongdoing, they recruited a bookkeeper rather than a certified accountant to prepare the charity's accounts. And in isolation from the other trustees, they controlled what financial information was supplied to the bookkeeper so that a false picture of the financial position was presented at meetings. Eventually, the main person was interviewed and admitted to a gambling problem, but denied stealing the charity's money, even when confronted with bank statements displaying frequent ATM withdrawals from the charity account, matching to their attendance and gambling activity at a casino. Again, all information we were able to obtain under our powers. The main person was prosecuted by the Ministry of Education for falsifying records and as a result was disqualified from being a trustee. The charity lost its education funding and the license to operate as an education facility and eventually was deregistered. We've had big issues with international groups seeking to gain the benefits of tax-free status but lacking true charitable purpose and seeking only to conceal funds from other tax regimes around the world. It was therefore no surprise when some New Zealand entities featured in the Panama Papers. To deal with such issues, we have a great international collaboration with charity regulators around the world, and we have regular multinational telephone conferences. On the smaller scale, I have encountered issues where small charities have decided not to have a dedicated bank account and instead merge charity funds with their own finances. They then fail to distinguish between private spending and charity spending and deliberately or inadvertently misuse the charity funds. But whether big or small, the issues of fraud often occur in charities when poor processes or a failure to stick to those processes allows the opportunity for wrongdoing to happen. For this reason, we are always pleased when charities under investigation take the opportunity to have a really good look at themselves and their processes and look to fix up the issues themselves. The fix-ups are often obvious and easy. There are some great resources available. We will always look at the opportunity to work with a charity to help them get back on track and consider that when they do this, it's a great outcome for us. I would also like to stress again that it's only a small minority of charities that engage in deliberate fraud. The vast majority have good people, good processes and controls. Thanks, Paul. That was really interesting to hear some actual case studies of charities. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about resources. To help you, we've put together a list of resources that you might like to have a look at. They cover things like financial policies, financial controls, governance, and some tips to protect your charity. And I can see we've got a couple of questions coming in, and I can see that someone's asked about some HR policies. So maybe this is the place that you go. Um, there's some light blog reading as well as a more in-depth resource, the Compliance Toolkit, and that's from our charity colleagues in the UK. We'll email the resources and a link to the webinar to you in the next few days. Be sure and share the links with other members of your charity that couldn't make the webinar today. Remember, please put fraud on your next meeting agenda and have a chat with your board or your committee about how to ensure your charity stays protected. So we've got time for some questions now. So if you could type them in, that would be fantastic. Um, if they could be a general question, not actually about your own charity specifically, that would be good. And if we don't get time to answer your question today, remember, please email it to us at info at charities.govt.nz. Now I'll just hand over to Paul and we'll see if we've got any questions coming through. Thank you, Francesca. Um, so one of the questions we've been asked 
is are there more case studies on fraud available? Um, I can see the interest in them. We don't have them at the moment, but I'm sure we could probably put some up on our Facebook site or our website uh, at some time in the future. At the moment, we don't have any other questions available. If you've got some, get furiously typing now. We'll give you a few moments more. But remember, if you don't have time or don't wish to ask your question now, you can always post them online at info at charities.govt.nz. Okay, so we've got another question coming in. So the question coming in is, hi, when donating to charities, to make sure it's the official one, should we always use a charity number or what? So luckily, the charities register is available publicly online. You can go onto our website and find the link and you can type in the first few names of a charity's full title and that should be able to bring up if they are a registered charity. If you've still got doubts, you can always send us a question about whether a charity is registered or not to our line on info at charities.govt.nz. Okay, um, so We'll leave you to a little bit technical, little bit technical and, we will, and we will reply by email, by email, email to, those ones. to those ones. So thank you for, so attending, you for attending the, the webinar, today. webinar today. It was great to, have, was you great with to us. have you with us. We hope you enjoyed, hope you enjoyed it. it and that you and also, that learned, you also a learned a few things about fraud, about fraud to take back to, your take back to your board. Thank you thank also, you also for, all the work for all the work you do, you do make New Zealand, make New Zealand, Zealand a better place, place for all of us. For all of us. Thank you, Tiano, and have a great day. And have a great day.